I never had a definite place, which was my room, or where I retired, especially to write. I was fishing around in the cardboard box, and it was apparent that there was this very old tape machine and a lot of tapes, and I thought they were probably beyond repair, but I found a digital genius in my local town of Cowbridge, and he managed to reset up the machine. And he called me up one morning and he said, I think you'd better get over here because I think I've cracked it. It was a very tense moment in the studio when my grandmother's voice suddenly appeared out of the depths of the machinery. All I needed was a steady table and a typewriter. A marble top bathroom table made a very good place to write. The dining room table in between meals was also helpful. My family usually noticed signs of approaching activity by saying, look, mummy's broody again. It's a bit eerie to start with. I mean, uh, it's even more eerie because there aren't very many examples of her voice which retain. I think I must have behaved rather as dogs do when they retire with a bone. They depart in a rather secretive manner and you do not see them again for an odd half hour. They returned self-consciously with mud in their nose. I think I must have done much the same. I mean, to me, she was just a perfectly normal, loving and affectionate grandmother. Uh, I mean, I, I was in my 30s when she died, but certainly during the time when I was getting to know her as a young boy, the fact that, you know, I got a, a signed book when it was at school, even in those days, created a certain amount of tension amongst my fellow boys at school. But she was a very normal person, actually, and, and a very professional person. And when she was working, she was working. And when she was with the family, she was with the family. Matthew Pritchard describing his grandmother, Agatha Christie, and the discovery of the recordings she made as she was dictating her autobiography into her tape machine. Matthew may have got signed copies, but when I first encountered Christie's work, I didn't even know such things existed. I used to stay a lot with my grandparents when I was young. We were a typical working-class family. No money to spare for luxuries like books. But for some reason, my grandparents had a copy of The Murder at the Vicarage, the only book in the house apart from the Bible. I was a voracious reader, and I'd often find myself with nothing to read after I'd finished my library books. One day, I must have been about eight or nine, I picked up that first Miss Marple novel, and it was love at first sight. I hold Agatha Christie entirely responsible for my choice of career, and I still enjoy her work as much as I ever did. In this archive on four, I'm joined by a party of Christie experts to discuss the tape recordings Matthew discovered and the light they shed on her writing. Laura Thompson is responsible for the latest acclaimed biography of Christie. John Curran has spent the last couple of years deciphering Agatha Christie's atrocious handwriting and he's just published Agatha Christie's secret notebooks. Playwright Kevin Elliott has updated And Then There Were None for the West End and he's written six dramatisations for TV, including one of the opening episodes of the new ITV1 series starring Julia McKenzie as Miss Marple. And the partnership of director and producer Enid Williams and writer-adapter Michael Bakewell are behind a raft of Christie productions broadcast on Radio 4, including nearly all the Marple and Poirot stories. Now, if this was one of her books... One of this closed group would be dead by the end of the programme. <laughs> so, fingers crossed, folks. <laughs> but before we hear from our gathering, here's Agatha's account of a dinner which she attended with her second husband, the archaeologist Max Malowan. It could be a scene lifted straight from one of her books. Mrs Ditchburn loved entertaining guests. I was introduced to her husband, Mr Ditchburn, and placed next to him. And he seemed to be a very silent man. This was perhaps explicable, owing to Mrs. Ditchman talking so much. He said nothing for a long time and sat in lowering silence. On the other side of me was an American missionary. He too was very taciturn and hardly spoke. Rather to my interest, when I looked sideways at him, I noticed that his hands were twisting and turning beneath the table and that he was slowly tearing a handkerchief to shreds. I found that rather alarming. His wife sat across the table and he too seemed in a highly nervous condition. There were about eight of us at the table and it was a curious evening. Mrs. Ditchburn was in full social flight, chatting with her neighbours, talking to me and to Max. 
Max was responding reasonably well. The two missionaries, husband and wife, were silent and tongue-tied. The wife watching her husband desperately, and he was turning twisting fingers, still tearing his handkerchief to bits. In a kind of daze and dream of half-sleep and stupor, ideas for a superb detective story came into my head. A missionary, slowly going mad, with the strain, the strain of what? The strain of something, at any rate. And wherever he has been, the torn up handkerchiefs, torn to shreds, would provide clues. As we gathered together in the dining room, I felt as if I was seeing everyone for the first time, and for the last. Mr. Mercado was twisting his fingers nervously. His wife was staring at him intently like a tigress waiting to spring. An extract from Michael Bakewell's Radio 4 dramatisation of Agatha Christie's murder in Mesopotamia with Becky Hindley as Nurse Leatheran. John, you've been reading through the 73 notebooks that Agatha left behind her. Are they filled with these kind of notes, these kind of details that, that feed her omnivorous appetite for character and story? Yes, they are, but mainly for plot ideas as distinct from characters. So she would have pages of different ways of poisoning people, pages of ways of committing murder that no one would suspect. She's one particularly gory one, someone stabbed through the eye with a hat pin. And because that's so untypical Agatha Christie, I suspect that's because it would be very difficult to tell how that person had been killed. So it was that aspect of it that interested her. And even though a character, someone she met or, or sitting beside at a dinner party may have influenced her, I don't think it was the person themselves. It was something about it was like the man shredding the handkerchief. That was what was important to her because she says in the introduction to one of the Penguin editions of her books that if she finds out personal details of somebody that she's met or seen, that person is dead to her, she can't use them anymore. How did she get started as a writer? Do we know what drew her to the detective novel? Laurel. Well, it was kind of modish, wasn't it, I think? It was just coming into the golden age of the British detective story. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I know that it's the story of the bet, but I, I, it has to be more than just a bet. I totally agree, yeah. yes. You don't write a book for a bet. No. Can you tell us about the, the bet? Well, I think the point, perhaps, is that she grew up in a family that was apparently conventional, this upper-middle-class family in Torquay, but actually was less conventional than appearances. Her mother, whom she adored, really, probably the love of her life, her mother, I would say, actually, her mother encouraged her to be clever. And she also had a very clever older sister, Madge, who wrote for Vanity Fair and all sorts of things. Although when she wanted to go to Girton, Madge, her father said, no daughter of mine's going to Girton. But nonetheless, they were encouraged to be creative. And Agatha, who really longed to be a musician more than a writer in her early years, she said in her 60s, I wish I'd been an opera singer. Nonetheless, when that came to an end, because her voice wasn't strong enough, she channeled this into writing. So the story of the bet was that apparently her sister said, I bet you couldn't write a detective story and I w wouldn't be able to guess the ending sort of thing. Um, but that, as John says, is not why you would write The Mysterious Affair at Stars, which must have been awfully hard work. Mm. Why does one start writing, you know? Well, I wish I, wish I knew the answer. <laughs> well, exactly. exactly so. Interestingly, she submitted the first novel under her initials, so the publishers didn't know whether it was a man or a woman. And one very clever reader said, I, I strongly suspect the hands of a woman. Yeah, I think at the time, literary fiction was no haven for women. Laura, in that last extract, she talks about Max Malowin, the archaeologist who was her second husband. He seems very different from what I know of her first husband, mm. Colonel Archie Christie. Was there a difference in their attitudes towards her writing? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, they were very different. I mean, Archie was, frankly, much more glamorous, and um, you can see why she, she fell for him head over heels, as indeed he did for her when she was a lovely young woman in 1912. You know, she was very good-looking. Um, Max was 14 years younger, and uh, it was much more of a companionship type marriage rather than a romantic love affair but they both encouraged her writing actually i mean archie theirs was ostensibly a very conventional marriage but he he 
was quite happy for her to write. N none of that sort of, you're my wife and you're staying at home and making my breakfast. There wasn't anything like that. And having b become a nurse during the war, a VAD, as it were, in the First World War, um, she was working in Torquay in what was then the town hall. And then I think she had a go of flu in 1916 or something and came back and worked in the dispensary. And that is what gave her the, it was the properties of poison in um, something she was working on that gave her the basic idea for Mysterious Affair at Styles. Um, and Max, although he criticised her grammar and said, my dear, you must learn how to use a semicolon, he was um, nonetheless quite happy for her to be making money and buying nice houses and funding a very nice life for them both. So he'd have been an idiot to stop her, really. I think there's no doubt that roughing it with him on the digs brought her into contact with a broader range of people than she would have encountered back in Torquay. Uh, one of the individuals she clearly fictionalised was the wife of the archaeologist who organised the expedition where she actually met Max Malowan. Catherine Woolley is a formidable figure who provides the prototype for Mrs Leidner, the victim in murder in Mesopotamia. These days I think we'd probably call her a control freak. In this excerpt from the Christie tapes, we get a sense of the power exerted by Catherine Woolley. And I should mention, by the way, that we've shortened some of Agatha's pauses for thought. Mm -hmm. The weather was bad now. Some of the waddies were much swollen and difficult to cross. We arrived at last, very wet and extremely tired, at Aleppo, at the comparative luxury and civilization of Barron's Hotel. The one thing I yearned for was a hot bath. I discovered the bathroom, managed to turn on some hot water. She, as usual, came out in clouds of steam and frightened me to death. I tried to turn it off and did not succeed, and had to yell to Max for help. He arrived down the passage, subdued the water, and told me to go back to my room and he'd call me when he'd got a bath sufficiently under control for me to enjoy it. I went back to my room and waited. I waited a long time and nothing happened. Finally, I sallied forth with my dressing gun, sponged fast under my arm. The door was locked. Max appeared. Where's my bath, I said. Oh, Catherine Woolley's in there now. Catherine, I said. You let her have my bath that you were running for me. Well, yes, said Max. She wanted it. He looked at me very straight in the eye with a certain firmness of manner. I saw that I was up against something like the laws of the Medes and Persians. To my mind, the whole pattern of the case revolved around the personality of Mrs. Leidner. Until I knew exactly what kind of a woman Mrs. Leidner was, I should not be able to know why she was murdered and who murdered her. <laughs> I began to see her as one of those women who are endowed by nature not only with beauty, but with a kind of calamitous magic which sometimes accompanies beauty. The same phrase occurred independently both to Dr. Riley and to Nurse Leatherman. La belle dame sans merci. More than one of you have commented on Mrs. Leiden's need to create drama. By my present age, I have learned pretty well how to deal with temperamental people of all kinds. Actors, producers, natural prima donnas, from the human point of view, such as Catherine Woolley, and indeed several other of my friends, my own mother had a dash of it. She could work herself into terrific states, but have forgotten all about them by the next day. But you seem so desperate, I would say to her. Desperate, said my mother, highly surprised. Was I? Did I sound like that? Max's mother also had a fair amount of artistic temperament. The result of this is that I think both Max and myself remarkably calm individuals. It's reassuring to me to hear that I'm not alone when it comes to strip mining my life for material. I mean, most writers I know regard every human encounter as data that can be filed away for future reference. It's probably actually our least attractive aspect. We may well be genuinely compassionate and humane when our friends and family endure terrible traumas, but always there is the wicked angel whispering in our ears, you can use this. <laughs> you know, we tell ourselves that the creative process transforms the reality into unrecognisable fictions, but I suspect that's not always true. But in that respect, Agatha Christie was perhaps more honest than, than many of us. Kevin, criticism often levelled at Christie is that her characterisation is poor. But one of the things you see very clearly in her plotting is a fascination with the dynamics of power in relationships. 
Is that one of the elements that makes her interesting to adapt, do you think? Yes, I mean, first of all, I'd say that I don't think it's quite fair to say that she isn't very good at characterization. I think she's quite brilliant, really, at um, choosing a few um, pertinent uh, characteristics and painting a character with a few broad strokes. And this is great for a dramatist because it's like being given a few ingredients for a recipe and then you can go away and... Um, cook it up in whichever way you want to, to make a, an actable character, a fully rounded, um, dramatic character. I think what's fatal for a dramatist is if you're given a, a pages of description for a character, which, however brilliantly written, for, for your job as a dramatist, it's not that helpful. I think, and I, I'm not disagreeing necessarily with what Kevin has just said, but I think, as far as she was concerned, everything was subservient to plot. And in some cases she cheats in the sense that it's very difficult to believe that the character that you've been with for 200 pages turns out to be the villain in the end, even though it may make for a very clever plot device and it may surprise the reader. But I think everything she does is based around the plot. Because in the notebooks, it's the idea of, you know, a clever way of poisoning, a clever way of disguising the body, a clever way of faking the time. And then she builds the characters around that, certainly during her golden age from, say, 1930 to 1950. After that, then, um, she may have been more character-driven. I think Michael, part of the problem is that she has this very solid group of, of, of very real characters in many cases, in the Miss Marple stories, for example, but then she has to have as many suspects as possible, and she kind of begins to handle people who she knows nothing about and fails, I think, to make them three-dimensional. And one of the problems I encountered when um, dramatising Agatha was that you really cannot have all these suspects in all the time. You would have to concentrate the thing on the more plausible characters, I think. But I agree so strongly with Kevin. I really can't emphasise this enough. If you take her, what I would consider to be her best books, Five Little Pigs, which I think is her best book, Crooked House, Taken at the Flood, The Hollow, I think plot and character are absolutely working at, at the same pace, as it were. It's that geometry which, within which is subsumed so much more that makes her good, otherwise we would not still be talking about her now. I so agree with you. And, of course, that makes her an absolute joy to cast. The character, yes, huge. Well, no, I'm, I'm not saying she doesn't write good characters, but, I, but what I am saying, for instance, to take the, an example of, of one of Laura's, The Hollow, that is a very good novel, but it is not a very good detective novel because the characters take over, and they're wonderful characters, and the dramatic tension in the house that weekend is superb, but there is nothing in the, in the way of clues and alibis and hints that you can, the reader can pick up on. I think it's very significant when she did, did The Hollow on stage. The first she, thing she did was to cut out Poirot. Poirot. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. She, yes. she felt well, Poirot just ought not to be in the story and, at all. And she's right, he shouldn't. I mean, he, he right. bought a house in the country. You, none of us could imagine Poirot buying a house in the country. And growing oh. marrows. <laughs> <laughs> no, not you've seen, I think. <laughs> but at the same time, does it have to, does detective fiction rely solely upon plots and train timetables? Oh, I think so. I think the, the detective novel that at its best is always a kind of biofeedback system. Mm. Mm. Whether you start with the character situation or whether you start with, with the plot, I think what happens as you go forward as the writer in the development stage before you start writing is you have this, this sort of sense of, of learning more about your character mm. and that feeds into what you, what's possible in terms of the plot, what the limitations of the plot are and that then feeds back into the character because if this is going to have to happen into the plot why is this person doing these things? What would possibly motivate them to behave in this way? And so that gives you more depth to the character, gives you backstory, it gives you a hinterland, and that then feeds into the plot about more possibilities. I yes. think with Christie, she probably generally started with the plot idea, mm. but I think as she as she developed the characters in the plot, they became it became part of this feedback system, and the two things fed into each other. Which I think is why when you when you look at the notebooks as, with the benefit of your of your book, you can see how a, a book developed from being yes. a very bare idea to being something that was much more more rich and, and more contextual. But some of her books just started with a quotation or with someone she saw or you know there's one that it just says old woman on train or something and that's we presume murder is easy. I mean we don't absolutely know what her starting point was and the human dynamic which I think is what she's primarily interested in even more than murder dare I say um, it, it, you know that can be plot as well if you like 
Because that needs untangling just the same as who put the footprint outside the window. But there are some, there are some books where I think we can see very clearly there was a, a very specific route for her. John, I have to say I find myself fascinated by the notebooks, uh, not least because they so closely resemble my own collection. And that's not just because of the appalling handwriting. But there's something reassuringly unsystematic. There are shopping lists and reminders to herself interspersed with like mm. quirky incidents or murder methods. Ideas sometimes took years to develop to the point where she was ready to write them, which again is something I recognise. And for those of us who aspire to writing good crime fiction, it is encouraging to realise that the books didn't spring fully formed from her mind at regular intervals. Well, this was the biggest surprise to me when I came across the notebooks, but because virtually all of her books are precision-tooled instruments with the plot all interlocking perfectly in the last chapter, I assumed that she would have beautifully detailed and ordered notes and that she would have a notebook for Murder on the Orient Express and a notebook for Peril at End House. But they're just so unimpressive. They're the ordinary notebooks, the copy books that we all used at school, completely chaotic. As you've just said, there are lists of items to bring from one house to the next, books that she needs to read, types of dahlias that she'll get the gardener to plant in between a very clever way of poisoning somebody or in, in between a very clever way of disguising the time of death of a body. So you have this vision of, of Agatha sitting in Greenway or in Wallingford with a notebook on her knee and she's plotting the latest Miss Marple and she suddenly thinks, oh, I said to the garden that I'd look up gardening catalogues and I must do a list. And she turns over the page and does a list of dahlias. Then she turns over the page again and gets on with the book, which it's, it's wonderful to look at them. But it was like a, a huge jigsaw. And one sparkling cyanide, for instance, is scattered over 12 notebooks. Now, we began the programme with Matthew Pritchard talking about the discovery of his grandmother's tape recordings, a, a surprise discovery. But you made your own surprise discovery, didn't you? The, t the two short stories. Yes, the room in which the notebooks were stored in Greenway House was a room that was full of her papers, manuscripts, contracts, typescripts, letters, diaries. There were piles of typescript and pages, and one of the stories was there in that, and it had been seen by other people, including Laura, the dog's ball incident. Yes. The second one, which is the original Twelfth Labour of Hercules, the, the collection, The Labours of Hercules, was published in 1947, and 11 of the stories had appeared previously in the Strand magazine, but for some odd reason, the Twelfth story was never published in the Strand. So when I was working in the house with the National Trust moving all her papers, there was a typescript of The Labours of Hercules. And I just looked at the beginning of each story and I realised that the last one in the bound typescript wasn't in the published collection. Now, I think it will be obvious when people read it why it wasn't published at the time. Um, but I can still remember that Saturday afternoon when I opened it and I sat reading for the first time in... 30-something years, a brand new Agatha Christie. I mean, things like that just don't happen. Yeah, I mean, I can remember the excitement when I saw it reported in the newspapers mm. that you'd discovered two new stories, and, you know, so I was just like, wow, something new to read. <laughs> uh, but the, both of those newly discovered stories feature Poirot. Mm. Now let's hear from the actors currently playing the Belgian detective, the Radio 4 Poirot, John Muffet, and David Suchet, who will be back with more adventures this autumn on ITV1. My voice, as you hear it now, is, is chess voice, or mm. it's... Or it's diaphragm voice are very low but if I think of Poirot as a walking brain which I do he wouldn't have his voice down there it would be in his head so I would have to move my voice from the bass voice that you hear now slowly to the chest voice into the throat voice into the head and up to the top of the mat and then put on the accent and talk like him in that is your cute Poirot the voices of the little grey sounds they have begun to sing to Poirot the very first thing I said was how do you know I can do a Belgian accent? This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed at home. I think he's, he's fascinating. The way she has him say, you know, I do not like murder. And, oh, the poor woman. He does have considerable amount of feeling. He's not, you know, just a technical detective. This little piggy had roast beef. This little piggy had none. His precision, his fastidiousness about his clothes and his hair, and particularly his shoes, which he always wears patent leather shoes, and he brings that same precision and finesse to the way he solves the crimes, doesn't he? And this little piggy cried, wee, 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 all the way home. I remember Agatha Christie in an interview saying he likes things to be square. 
not round. And I, that was a great help to me. I, I thought of that quite often. He's, he's creating these little geometrical patterns. You know, he's putting that factor at that factor. He likes to build houses of cards, doesn't he? And he puts that carefully there and that carefully there and that carefully there. Then he puts it all together until he comes to the nub of the thing. And then he brings his powers of psychology. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. That is the phrase the Arabs use before setting out on a journey. Eh bien, we too start on a journey. A journey into the strange places of the human soul. I think the eye of a camera is, is a lie detector. The methods of Poirot, monsieur, cannot always be a real. And if I pretend to think, you'll know it watching. Yeah, I have to actually work out what Poirot is thinking at any one time because there's a lot of reflection. And if I don't reflect properly, I will never draw you into thinking, what is he thinking? This case, when Poirot has almost given up scrabbling for purchase on its shell of armor, it opens to him like a flower. Good Lord. So, what do we do? We do what the murderer least expects Poirot to do. We return to the dig. All of us. I've got a special pair of shoes. They're made of very soft leather, and they make my feet feel small. And I always wear those, because that makes me feel like a, a little man, and a, a neat little man, you know. It, it does help, I think, on radio, and I touch my imaginary moustache. So th there is a kind of visual aspect to radio acting, I think. What are you doing in Broad Hinney after a murder, I suppose? Your supposition is quite correct, madame. I hope it's not my hostess, Mrs. Upward. No, it is not Mrs. Upward. Actually, it's her son I've come down here to see, Robin. He's supposed to be dramatizing a book of mine. Ah, oh, my felicitation, madame. Everyone tells me he's very clever. Oh, if he's so clever, I don't see why he doesn't write a play of his own. Leave my poor Finn alone. Your Finn? Ah, yes, your detective, Sven Hjursen. He's not even a Finn anymore. Mm. He's become a member of the Norwegian resistance movement. <laughs> uh, but tell me about your murder or whatever it is. No, it is not a very picturesque story. An old charwoman who was murdered and robbed five months ago, Mrs. McGinty. A young man was convicted and sentenced to death. And he didn't do it, but you know who did, and you're going to prove it. No, 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 you go too fast. John Muffet as Poirot, and Julia McKenzie as the irrepressible Ariadne Oliver, the fictitious crime writer who features as an occasional foil to Poirot. Laura, in her autobiography, she gives us clues about some of the influences which fed into her creation of this Belgian detective with his little grey cells and a neat moustache. Can you fill in some of the background for us? The, the one concrete thing that she lights upon is that um, there were these Belgian refugees in Torquay, First World War refugees, but actually the way in which she describes the the genesis of Poirot is, you almost feel it's a bit of a mystery to her. I mean, she obviously, again, we were talking about modish detective fiction. It was also, you know, the idea of a foreign detective. There was Marie belloc Lance had a guy called um, Popo, and th th there was someone called Eugene Valmont. But she talks about, she says, oh, yes, a little neat man, obsessed with symmetry, uh, egg-shaped, uh, name, Poirot, oh. And then she uses a phrase like, oh, that was settled, thank goodness. Uh, she's so disingenuous, the way she talks <laughs> about her own writing. Again, how do you know how you make up a character? There's this kind of felicitous stew that's going on in her head where she comes up with this man. I mean, Miss Marple is far more anchored mm. because there's hints toward her grandmothers and the matriarchy in which she more or less grew up. I think people expect writers to perhaps be able to rationalise what we do much more than, than is actually yes. possible. A lot of the time it just is what feels right. And it, John Moffat was talking there about his attitude to playing Poirot. One of the other things he told us was that although scenes in filming and radio plays are often recorded out of sequence, you always do the denouement at the end and you range the cast of characters opposite John Moffat as if they really were in the library being told by Poirot what was happening. Is that right? It has a very good psychological effect on the cast because faced with John Moffat 
at the denouement and put the fear of God into anybody. <laughs> he wears a suit on the last day as well. He's quite right about the shoes um, and, he, and a kind of special tie and the way he likes to look particularly on the last day because, of course, Poirot has the denouements and Miss Marple doesn't. And I've said often, particularly to young actors who may be doing their first radio or something, watch him. He plays the cast. He lifts his eyes up and will look at the member of the cast. And you, you just see actors, incredibly experienced and distinguished actors, free. They know they haven't done it, but they're absolutely <laughs> terrified. It, it's quite, quite wonderful. I think the overall problem, of course, for Agatha Christie with, with Poirot was that she introduced him as a man of, of 60. Over the, the, the years, <laughs> he's about 120 exactly. by the time yes. you reach the, 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 the last of the Poirot novels. <laughs> I think she described him somewhere else as kind of an old man of the sea clinging around yes. her. She was <laughs> desperately trying to get rid of. And of course she did try to get rid of him. But the publishers and the public wanted Poirot. Mm. So it was pretty much like Ariadne Oliver complaining about her mm. thin. Yes, yes. She was she was trapped by him even long after she was mm. bored by him and, and no longer interested in what he had to offer. And yet when uh, you read her letters to her agent and that kind of thing, she was very possessive about Poirot. She didn't want yeah. anyone mm. coming along and playing him on the television or anything that was... Um, yeah. She hated all the actors who played him in the theatre. Yes, as well. <laughs> yes, she was. She, she set a worth on him. I mean, do you think, Kevin, when, when it comes to adapting Poirot, that, that, that there's a kind of straitjacket here, a sense of this is, this is who Poirot is and this is all he could be? No, I've, I've not felt straitjacket. And I also feel with Poirot that he's uh, seen quite a bit more of life than um, Marple has. He's been through more. He's, he's suffered a little more. Um, and uh, I think this comes out especially in um, The Five Little Pigs. The characters, uh, their, their lives seem to be profoundly affected by what, what happened in the past. And I love the structure as well, the, the same sequence of events told from five different angles. We've been talking about the difference between Marple and Poirot. On the tape recordings, Agatha Christie does talk about how a character in the murder of Roger Ackroyd influenced the creation of Miss Marple the legendary spinster sleuth, who has been played by actresses including Margaret Rutherford, Joan Hickson, Geraldine McEwen, the Radio 4 Marple, June Whitfield. I hope I'm not intruding. And in the latest TV version, Julia McKenzie. It was the clothes peg that worried me. It's mentioned in the article. I think you can only do it off your own persona. Some aspect of you must work in it. I watched Geraldine when she was doing it, but my big excuse for not doing it the same way or even trying to copy what Geraldine did is that um, Christie did, in fact, write it in two different ways. When she first invented it, um, it was almost exactly what Geraldine was playing. And then when she picked up the part about ten years later, she became sort of sturdier and tweedier, and I've sort of gone for... Well, not exactly for that, but maybe somewhere between the two. Such a contemptuous gesture. It gave me a kind of picture of the murderer. To do a thing like that is really very wicked indeed. And so pointless, with no rhyme or reason. Oh, no, my dear. I wouldn't say that. Obviously, the time that she's lived through, two world wars, um, and when she was young would be when the first world war was on. So I suspect that she did lose uh, her fiancé, our lover, in, in that war. And uh, that, uh, like a lot of people in that generation, sort of, cl not exactly close off, but um, hold those memories and, and really don't want any other relationships. I have now no recollection at all of writing Murder in the Vicarage. That is to say, I cannot remember where, when, how I wrote it, why I came to write it. And I don't even remember why it was that I selected a new character, Miss Marple, to act as a sleuth in the case. Certainly at the time, I had no intention of continuing her. My nephew, who is really quite a successful novelist, is in the habit of comparing life at St. Mary Mead to the scum on a pond. But as I once pointed out to him, if you were to smear that scum on a slide and examine it under a microscope, you would find it teeming with life of a quite unexpected kind. Take the vicarage, for example. A haven of righteousness and tranquility, you might think. But you would be surprised. She is fairly pedantic, very focused, although she gives the impression that she's a bit scatty, which she is very far from. I really based my characterization of her 
on a very simple statement that she's inclined to make. I hope I'm not intruding, but the door was open, and in the circumstances... I think it's possible that Miss Marple followed on to the pleasure I've taken in portraying Dr. Shepard's sister in The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. She had been my favourite character in the book, an acidulated spinster full of curiosity, knowing everything, hearing everything, to put complete detective service in the home. When the book was adapted for a play by Michael Morton, it was some, one of the things that saddened me most, that Caroline was removed. True, the doctor was provided with another sister, a much younger sister, a pretty girl, who could apply Poirot with a romantic interest. I had no idea when the play was first suggested. What terrible grief and suffering you go through with plays owing to the alterations made in them. I was too nervous and submissive to be a good fighter at that period. Now that is interesting. That must have been why I branched off to write Murder at the Vicarage. Reading it now, I'm not so pleased with it as I was at the time. It has, I think, rather too many characters and rather too many subplots but at any rate the main plot is good I like Miss Marple I like all the rest of the village and the village was as real to me as could be the following day I went home to St Mary Mead but the mystery of Hillside House would not let me alone even Dolly Bantry's account of the battle royal over the fancy work stall at the fate could not distract me the killer, if there really was a killer, had committed murder and got away with it. And indeed, there are several villages remarkably like it. Even in these days, little maids from orphanages and well-trained servants on their way to hire things have faded away. But the daily women and the young married women who work in factories and all the rest of it who have come to succeed them are just as real and just as human. This Gladys, did she have any relations, do you know? No, she didn't. She came to me from the orphanage, and I trained her for domestic service. She was only 17. Dear me, so young. Was she a pretty girl? Oh, no, not at all. And rather stupid, too, but I was fond of her. Maybe even a little sorry for her. One doesn't really know what to do with the Gladyses of this world. Kevin, that's an extract from your script for Pocketful of Rye, one of the new Marples starring Julia McKenzie and featuring Matthew McFadden as Inspector Neil and Lucy Kohu as Pat. Another easy swipe that's, that's taken against Christie is that her depiction of social class is, is both hackneyed and, and, and paradoxically a kind of wistful harking back to a past that never really was. But in that archive footage we heard, it's really rather poignant hearing her talk about what her characters might refer to as the lower orders. Do you think the criticisms are fair? Possibly, I think. They, they, they are sometimes. What, what, I, what I try and do is rectify that a, a little bit without being pompous about it. You, you have to make the character work for a modern audience. And so the relationship, for example, between um, Marple and the, her maid in um, Pocketful of Rye, I do think works. She has a tremendous ability for tenderness as well. I think Pocketful of Rye mm. is a really good example of mm. that. And her passion that justice will be done. Oh, yeah. This mm. lovely little fluffy old lady who is truly an avenging angel, mm. particularly mm. pocket full of rye, mm. and I think Nemesis mm. are the classic mm. ones. And it's interesting also that with those, she's particularly on the side of young, defenceless mm. yes. people. Mm. Yes. I also wonder if, if another thing that the passage of time has done is, is to blur our appreciation of Christie's humour. I don't think it's a coincidence that most of the actresses who have played Marple have a track record in comedy. I've always thought she was a great pricker of pomposity. And I think the Marple books in particular allow her to take little sideways digs at all sorts of people. You'd hate to live opposite Miss Marple, wouldn't you? Oh, God, oh, God. yes. Oh, do you? anything <laughs> at all. I'd be terrified. Uh, I, think, I think we writers often use our work to make ourselves feel better about our own lives. And we don't always know we're doing it as well. Um, Laura, you mentioned earlier that, that you think in some ways Miss Marple was a, was a comfort figure for Christie at a time when her first husband had left her and 
Do you think she was reaching out, maybe consciously or unconsciously, for something that she could cling on to? It's such a tricky one, this, isn't it? Because you're so hesitant to, to read motives into writers' minds. It's, it's dangerous. But her father was lovely, and he was quite an ineffectual, charming sort of man. American, sort of Edith Wharton character almost. But he died when she was 11. She grew up with her mother and... Um, her grandmother and her great-aunt and, of course, this clever older sister. And they, it was what amounted to a matriarchy. And I think particularly one of her grandmothers, this marvellous woman, Margaret Miller, who was, you know, the kind of woman who would know across a crowded room if two people were having an, an adulterous affair or something. And again, that trait of Miss Marple's of being a, a kindly Christian woman who thinks the worst of absolutely everybody. And I think it's probably right, you know. We call it cynicism, but it's realistic, isn't it? People mm. are quite often doing the worst possible things. And uh, I think that's... Miss Marple is... It's an extraordinary concept when you think about it. Yeah, and I think that a character like that doesn't just come out of, of, of fluffiness. No. I think that comes out of conflict. It comes out of the understanding of, of what conflict does in people's lives. And that break with her first husband was a huge rupture for her, um, personally, but also, I mean, in social terms, it just, just wasn't the done thing in her class at that time. You had to keep a brave face on things all the time. And, of course, um, we come to the elephant in the room that's always there when we talk about Agatha Christie, the incident that turned her own life into a front-page news mystery. What happened to her to make her disappear from her life and flee to Harrogate, of all places? Harrogate's what? the talkie of the north, I think, probably. <laughs> but, um, well, it was the year 1926, and the factor that's perhaps sometimes overlooked is that her mother had died that year in April, and her mother, as I've said, she was incredibly close to her mother, and while her mother was still alive, I think she could hang on to that almost ch childlike vision of her life, in a way. But what was happening behind the scenes was that her husband was becoming friendly with another woman. We don't know quite how friendly. But um, while she was down in Torquay turning out her mother's things, he turns up and says, excuse me, I'm in love with another woman. I'd like a divorce. And it, it's always seemed to me that those two things coming upon her, and she was 36, but she'd led, led a very protected life. She was wiser in her books than in her life, if you like. And what people call the disappearance has never seemed to me such a mystery as all that. She wrote a letter to her brother-in-law saying, I'm going to a spa town in the north of England. And her brother-in-law was friendly with her and with her husband, and he was the only person who was, really, and I think he was meant to act as intermediary and get Archie to go and rescue her from Harrogate. But, of course, the idea that you would disappear and only your husband would get to know about it shows that she was... <sighs> She was acting logically, but she wasn't herself any longer, if you like. And I get quite angry when people call it a stunt, because she was obviously in a, in a very, very bad way. But mm. Archie went up to Harrogate to find her, and it didn't make any difference. He still went and married the other woman. I, I think she also, I think, didn't really appreciate the extent to which she had become uh, more than just a person sitting at home writing her books, that yes. she actually was on the verge of becoming a celebrity and the disappearance catapulted her into that level. We heard Agatha herself there complaining about the attitude of one of the writers who turned her story into theatre. Of course, we often forget now that Christie herself was a successful playwright and adapter of her own work. Every year for 20 years she had plays running in the West End and still the mousetrap holds the record for the longest running theatrical production in the world. So she understood very well the differing demands of writing for the page and the stage. She had earned the right to be critical. Amazingly, although the mousetrap has been running in the West End for as long as the Queen's been on the throne, there are still enough people who don't know the denouement to make it financially viable. Here's Matthew Pritchard and his grandmother celebrating its 10th anniversary. I mean, I certainly went to the mousetrap in, in its early days because I remember going to see um, Richard Attenborough and, and his wife Sheila Sim, but not, I don't think, for the opening night. And I think probably I did go to the opening night of Witnesses of Prosecution, which was a couple of years later. That, that was sort of one of the turning points in her career because, you know, up till then she had, although there had been the odd film, um, she was almost exclusively a, an author. And she was absolutely fascinated with the theatre and she was even prepared to forego her usual anathema, if that's the word for publicity and journalists and all that kind of thing, by appearing at first nights and things like that. But I think it was the only time she appeared even remotely in public all the time I knew her. 
Response now from Mrs. Agatha Christie. Thank you, Mrs. Christie. <sighs> this is awful. <laughs> I never have been any good at making speeches. And usually someone has come to the rescue who's made my speech for me. But nobody's going to help me tonight. So I've got to do it myself. Anyway, the first thing is the great thanks and the really heartfelt gratitude I feel for this this great party tonight and the goodness of everybody. And it's terrible excitement of having a play that's run ten years and longer than any other play. And sometimes I really can't believe it's me. <laughs> because, I mean, so it's all the sort of thing that would happen to me, I should say. I mean, if I was writing a book, it wouldn't be a person like me who would have written a play that <laughs> runs for ten years. So don't let anybody say that nothing exciting happens to you when you are old, because it does. It's just as nice to be 72 as it is to be young. In fact, tonight it couldn't be more exciting. Kevin, you adapted and then there were none. The play which started life as Ten Little Niggers. And you've reread her own stage version for this programme. What's your reaction to it? I read it for the first time, actually, because uh, when I did my play, I... Uh just worked from the uh, novel. And I must say, um, <laughs> with all due respect, I do think it's a little bit of a cop-out that uh, she uh, gives it a happy ending on the rather spurious grounds that women can't shoot straight. They realise that there's an enemy lurking within, there's an enemy lurking without, because World War II is about to start. And my idea for the play was that um, we begin with all ten characters on stage and we don't have any extraneous characters, no people from the mainland coming over, no police, nothing. We just have the ten characters and by the end they're all dead. And it's a dark play. It's a, you know, nasty, harsh morality tale. And um, I think it's, it's terrific. And, and so when I read her play, I was a, a little disappointed. I still remember the, the chill of reading that for the first time. Yes. How far can you go in the theatre? Is it harder to pull off than on the TV or the radio? I think the important thing, what I find important, is that you have to chip away at the plotting, which is always ingenious and sometimes brilliant, and get to what I would describe as the emotional undergrowth of the novel. And once you've touched base with that, I think everything else falls into place. Because I think there's a danger with uh, uh, dramatising Christie that you can fall into pastiche or indeed facetiousness. But I think as long as you've got a, a sort of emotional core, then you can go for the high comic style, you can go for camp, you can go for the melodrama, but it's rooted. And I think that's what's important. Christie was always at great pains to play fair with the reader. It was one of the cardinal rules of the game when she started out, and she stuck with it. The clues are all there in the text, and one of the key lessons I learned from her was how to disguise those pieces of key information, how to hide things in plain sight, how to hide a tree in a wood. Enid and Michael, you were working together on the radio dramas. You must have looked at the question of how to insert the clues without flagging them up in a medium where it's all about the words. Is it a problem preventing actors from overstressing that key information? My problem often goes completely in the opposite direction. Mm. There are one or two novels where the denouement is completely impossible. D D Dead Man's Folly is a classic example. I read that three times trying to find what on earth had happened at the end. Um, one, two, buckle and, my shoe. And, <laughs> Please, I mean, that's one of the most complicated plots in I history, think I think. Plot, and so what you have to do all the time is, is to kind of find ways of extracting the storyline, making it fairly clear what's going on, because you do want the audience to have a chance of deciding who it is. Yes, you've got to pop these little clues in and just mm. say to whoever's got that particular line, you know, just make sure it's clear but underplayed. Before we come to our own assessment of, of Agatha Christie's writing, let's hear her in her own words. If I could write like Elizabeth Burry or Muriel Spark, I should jump to high heaven in delight and excitement. But I know very well that I can't, so it will never occur to me to produce a slavish attempt to copy them. I have learned I should certainly have learned by now that I am me and that I can do the things that, as one might put it, me can do. But I cannot do the things that me would like to do. 
as the Bible puts it, who by taking thought can add a cubit to his stature. So, looking at her work overall, what strengths do we see in it and what weaknesses in it? Oh, tremendous storytelling. She engages us. And for me, there actually is nobody like her. Michael? She was a very humane storyteller, I think. And the, the interesting thing about it is that all these characters remained tremendously vivid in one's mind. And the extraordinary thing about Agatha's uh, at her best is that she's tremendously moving, which I think what makes her, for me, a very distinguished writer indeed. Laura, what's, what's your take? I think, well, not by us, but I think she is incredibly underrated. I really do. I think her simplicity is deceptive. And I go back to what Kevin says about the human dynamic, which I think underpins the books. Murder on the, on the Orient Express is about what is justice, what constitutes the nature of justice. And she never wanted to explore those ideas outside the geometry of plot. That doesn't mean they're not there. Well, for me, she's, she's the greatest writer of the classical detective story that ever wrote and probably will ever write in the sense that that type of detective novel is no longer being written. And I think it comes down to... I absolutely agree with Laura, her, her simplicity, um, but also her readability. Kevin, what would you pick? Well, obviously, uh, she's an uh, ingenious uh, uh, plotting, um, but, but I think that what, what she does do sometimes is um, take you completely by surprise with a, a scene or um, a speech that comes completely from left field. But also, I think it's very poignant listening to her speaking of her limitations, if you like, because I think she did have this modesty, but of course she's also phenomenally successful. I mean, I think, you know, as a writer, as a practitioner, what I probably learned from her more than anything else was how to plot, how to tell a story. But that of itself wouldn't explain why I'm still drawn to her after all these years. Uh, there are plenty of other writers from the Golden Age who could make an immaculate plot, who could, who could turn a complex situation on a dime, who could commit the impossible crime, who could perpetrate the unbreakable alibi. And we don't read them today, but we do go back to Christie, and it is because of that humanity. I think it is mm. because at some very profound level she understands what makes human beings work what motivates us to do the things that we do. And she never belaboured these points. She didn't have to write a sort of, you know, five-page psychological breakdown of the murderer. But she would put those few deft strokes, she would bring it all to life for us. And I think um, she did, obviously, uh, draw very closely on her own experiences of the world and her own experiences of where she travelled to and her understanding of people when she wrote her books. But she disguises that, I think, very well in the crime novels. I think it is, however, a different matter when we come to the Mary Westmacott novels. And I think, Laura, you've pointed out, particularly in your biography, that that's where we need to go if we want to see her life reflected in her work. Well, they are the polar opposite of detective fiction. They are every question is left unanswered. Nothing is tied up neatly. It's like everything she wanted to think about and explore, she was set free to do in those books. And she couldn't have done that except under a pseudonym. I did feel quite strongly that their muse was Archie Christie, to be honest, because I felt they were very much about... Well, one of them is directly, autobiographically, the story of her first marriage, Unfinished Portrait. The Rose and the Yew Tree, which I actually think is the best book she ever wrote, is set in... It seems improbable almost. It's the sort of aftermath of the Attlee election victory. And it's such an interesting disquisition on class and all the things that, again, in her detective fiction, we think, oh, she might be being a bit simplistic here. I, I don't personally think that, but her detractors might say that. They're really about what is love and what does it mean to still be in love with someone who clearly no longer loves you and is love purely illusory? And those questions that clearly tormented her after her first marriage broke down. And I think they were a necessity to her and weirdly she wrote her best detective fiction I think when she was also enabled to write as Mary Westmacott when she had that outlet. Well we've sat around the table and had our say about Agatha Christie's strengths and weaknesses and we're all still alive honestly oh, I promise you <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to leave you now with Agatha Christie's personal motto and her own assessment of a life that spanned 86 years from 1890 to 1976. I am not and never shall be a good conversationist. I am so easily suggestible that I have to get away by myself before I can know what I really think and need to do. I can't draw, I can't paint, I can't model or do any kind of sculpture. I can't hurry without getting rattled. I can't say what I mean easily. 
I can write it better. I can stand fast on the matter of principle, but I can't stand fast on anything else. I have the disqualification that although I know tomorrow is Tuesday, if somebody tells me more than four times that tomorrow is Wednesday, after the fourth time, I accept that it is Wednesday and act accordingly. This is the most shocking form of weakness. But what can I do? Well, I can write. I could be a reasonable musician, but not a professional one. I can improvise matters of domestic life. This has been a most useful accomplishment, and one which I advise anyone who has it to be duly grateful for having been granted it by Providence. The things I can do with hairpins would surprise me. How often there flashes into my head a picture of the plate that hung upon my nursery wall, a pottery one that I think I must have won at one of the regattas. Be a wheel greaser if you can't drive a train, is written across it. And never was there a better motto. The voice of Agatha Christie ending this week's Archive on Four, which was presented by Val McDermott and produced by Robin Reed.